Father, we come before you. We bless you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your word. May your word be in us. May we hide it in our hearts that we would not sin against you. I pray that you would be glorified. We love you and honor you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, before we get started in the study, I'd uh, just like to announce once again, we will answer all questions afterwards, so let's hold the questions until afterwards. And for those of you who are watching online, uh, if you'd like to send in a question, we'll try to get that and maybe having some time delay. So once again, hold the questions till afterwards. And if you're online watching, we will try to answer some of those questions. But once again, it will be on a, a little bit of delay. So with that, you ready? Yes. All right. Now I needed to read yes, one you're through. Good. Just up to the genealogies. Yes. So we're going to be like everybody else. We're going to skip stuff. We're going to talk about it, but we're not not going to try to pronounce easy. all those. Names. We covered it. We covered it in the <laughs> digging deeper. All right. It reads like this. Now, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being the governor governor of Judea. Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Iteria, and the region of Traconius, Traconitis, and Linus, Lin, Lycia, Lycianitis, Tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas, Caiaphas, were high priests, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Whew. That was a mouthful. Amen. <laughs> and he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the books, in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the, in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which does not bear fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, to him do likewise. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more <clears throat> than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal trap sandal strap I am not worthy to loose he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor and gather wheat into his barn but the chaff he will be he will burn with unquenchable fire and with many other exhortations he preached to the people but Herod the tetrarch being rebuked by him concerning Herodias his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evil which Herod had done, also added this, above all, that he shut John up in prison. Then all the people were baptized. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Now Jesus began his ministry at about 30 years of age and was supposed and was 
suppose the son of Joseph. And I'm going to go ahead and stop right there because we're going to get in the genealogies a little bit later. All right. That was a mouthful. Okay. Thank you very much for reading that for me. Okay. You may wonder why Luke would have bothered recording all the officials in office at this time. Like, what difference does it make and who cares other than maybe Bill? <laughs> but it was a great idea because it gives us a fixed point in time in history that this biblical event took place. Josephus was a late first century Pharisee and historian that recorded the events we are talking about today. So it's not just a biblical, a biblical story. Roman officials were Tiberius Caesar, he was the emperor, Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was the tetrarch of Iteria, which is a northern area and east of the Jordan River. Jewish officials were Annas and Caiaphas, uh, and his brother, uh, wait, and we were a high priest at this time. The date and time is about A.D. 28-29. Why these names seem so familiar to us is because these are some of the same officials that crucified Jesus about three years later. Ooh. It also shows that it also shows the complexity of the historical and political situation in Israel during Jesus's day and the Israelite had to deal with the official the edicts of the the rules coming down from the Roman Empire as well as the regulations of the governor over Judea and the judgments of the church leaders remember when we were studying Luke 1 Elizabeth and Zacharias had a son and they called him John <clears throat> It was about 30 years and at this uh, since that time and God is calling John up out of the wilderness to go into the region around the Jordan preaching and baptizing. Little is known about his life since birth but according to Matthew 3 verse 4 John resembled the prophet Elijah in manner and dress. Records show that John dressed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. John preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book and words of Isaiah the prophet. It's been about 400 years since the Israelites had heard from a prophet of God. In Isaiah 40 verses 4 and 5, Isaiah writes, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places will be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Amen. The crying in the wilderness. John's voice is the crying in the wilderness, calling the people there to ready themselves for the coming of the Lord. Remember, there's no internet, no TV, no cell phones. So everything was strictly word of mouth to carry out this message. Prepare the paths means to clear the obstacles. It represents the hearts of people who must be spiritually prepared by repentance for God's glory to be revealed on the earth. Luke mentions from Isaiah that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This statement highlights the fact that, the sal that salvation is a free gift for all people. Amen. Verse 7 and 9, John says to the multitudes, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Among many of the multitudes were Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day. They were looking to hear John the Baptist speak. John called upon the people to be baptized as a way of showing that they wanted to renounce their old way of life and prepare their hearts for the coming of the Messiah. Many people went through the outward motion of baptism, but their actions did not truly represent their inward attitude. These people were not genuinely interested in the kind of king and kingdom that John was presenting. John the Baptist warned that the fruits of repentance are necessary. 
not the claim of being sons and daughters of Abraham. External genealogical connections would not change one's attitude to God. God's looking for a changed heart, not who they are related to. In verse 10 through 14, the people asked, what shall we do then? A genuine change of mind would result in a change of action for the people. The repenters were instructed to give to those in need to work at their jobs with integrity, to refrain from abusing their power, and to have compassion and to be fair, to, and to be content with the earnings of a basic wage which is a good advice for all of us today. Verse 15 to 17, the people wondered whether John was a Christ or not. John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal straps I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John's baptism was minor compared to what was coming from Jesus. Holy Spirit and fire is a reference to the first and second coming of Christ. At the second coming, there will be a harvest where the wheat will be the wheat will be gathered into the barn, those that will be the, un, the believers, and separated from the chaff, which is unbelievers, which will be burned in the unquenchable fire. With many other exhortations, John preached to the people. He rebuked Herod for divorcing his wife to marry his own niece Herodias, who already had been the wife of his brother Philip. Herod had John put in prison. Now these verses clearly are out of sequence um, because in the next verse, it's going to say that John baptized with Jesus, and so if he was in prison, that would not be quite the case so uh, or uh, Luke wrote topically and the other gospel seemed to be written more chronologically John the Baptist faithfully finished his God-given assignment and prepared the people to meet the Messiah the Son of God one day after all the others had been baptized Jesus presented himself for baptism at the Jordan John at first refused to comply. He felt unworthy. According to Matthew 3, 14 and 15, John felt he himself needed to be baptized by Jesus. But Jesus said, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all, all righteousness. And John permitted it. Besides fulfilling prophecy, one would wonder why did the sinless Son of God want to be baptized? In his baptism, he identified with the sinners that he came to save. It was the official start of his ministry. Baptism was by immersion, which is a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. Our Lord's baptism in water was a picture of the work of redemption. When Jesus came up out of the water, the Father spoke from heaven and identified him as the beloved Son of God. Okay, the, the Father spoke uh, from heaven and identified him as the beloved Son of God. Um, and the Spirit visibly came upon Jesus in the form of a dove, a beautiful display of the Trinity. It, it was, um, when we're studying um, this, uh, it was interesting that uh, we, you have, we, I asked, is, was um, John the Baptist really classified or considered a prophet? Uh, because he denied it himself when they said, are you a prophet? He said, no, I'm not. But he, he prophetically talked about the coming of Jesus and so on, what he would represent. But he also said something that was really struck me, and that was that he must increase while I must decrease. Now, if that's not prophetic for us today, I don't know what is. Um, okay, I'm going to get into the um, genealogy, which is a very confusing thing. It was confusing to me until I got into this. Um, and uh, genealogy is important to us today. Um, we have this 23 and me. We're looking back at uh, to see where our ancestors came from and what country we might have derived from and so on. And uh, it's, it's real popular, but you, you have to look at uh, Timothy warned that, uh, you know, too much of this sometimes creates problems and, and causes, uh, I guess for the Jews especially, it caused a lot of dissent and so on. My, uh, an interesting note, uh, this didn't come from genealogy, it came from 
from my um, uh, word of mouth in the family, but my uncle was, I mean, my grandfather through my mother's side was raised in Joplin, Missouri. And uh, his, his um, brother ran with uh, Frank and Jesse James. Now that was a Belton, not a Lawless. You'd, you'd be kind of appropriate if it was a <laughs> Lawless. <James>. Anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to try to muddle through this, and it's it's a bit and it was a bit convoluted. It's a bit, con uh, but I, I want uh, hopefully I can uh, clarify it for everybody. Genealogy was very important in the, in the uh, Bible. Uh, it talked about uh, you know your lineage, where you came from, what tribe, and so on. Particularly. Um, particularly in the New Testament, there are two genealogies. One is in uh, is Matthew, and uh, one is in in the book of Luke. Uh, it establishes lineage, uh, one's Jewishness, one's tribal identity, and one's right for the for the um, priesthood or kingship. But and usually, and most of the times, it usually came through the man side of the of the. It uh, didn't talk much about women. However, uh, I had married a Jewish lady. She helped me raise my kids, and uh, they told me that that the the, uh, the being a Jew came from the mother. So that was kind of a confusing thing to me. Um, <clears throat> it's in um, the biblical. Uh, uh, or, or I'm sorry, it's important uh, of messianic genealogy. Messianic genealogy, in order to, for the Messiah to be authentic, he had to follow biblical prophecies. Okay, well, one was the uh, he had to be the seed of Abraham. The Messiah had to come from the nation of Israel. Uh, had to be of the house of uh, of David, um, or well, pardon me, the seed of Judah first of all. And uh, had to come from the tribe of Judah. He had to be from the house of David or the family of David. And the last but not certainly not least is that is he had to be from the seed of a woman or from humanity. This was this was important. We got to remember these things. Um, there are there are two genealogies, as I said before, in the Bible. One is uh, 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 the genealogy of Joseph, and that's in Matthew one one to seventeen, and the other is Mary's genealogy. That's Luke three uh, twenty three to twenty eight. Um, Matthew's genealogy. Uh, it talks about angels appear to Joseph. It's talking about strictly to Joseph and how Joseph felt this, uh, had this situation or uh, understood this. Uh, Joseph's thoughts, uh, his experiences, so on. Um, in Luke's genealogy, it's Mary's perspective entirely. Uh, an angel appears to Mary, explains to her that she has favor and and that she will have a son and and uh, um, and to, to to name him um, um, Jesus. Jesus. Well, not Emmanuel. Jesus, but Emmanuel. Yeah. <laughs> but why the need for two genealogies? I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense, especially since it, you know, um, we know that uh, that Jesus's real father was not Joseph. So why, why the need for this? A common answer that, uh, that people seem to have is that, that one was the gospel of the royal line, and the other was the gospel of the real line. But we're find, we'll find out later on that that's not exactly the case. Um, remember, uh, one of the two requirements of Jesus' kingship or throne of Judah was a direct descendant of David. So in Isaiah 7, uh, 5, and 6, when there was a conspiracy uh, to do away with the house of David, God warned that any conspiracy was doomed. Uh, the plans of mankind are fertile when futile. it comes... Pardon me? Futile. The futile, I'm sorry, futile when it comes to oppose the will of God. Requirements for the throne of Israel was prophetic sanction or divine appointment. That you'll find that in 1 Kings 11, 26 to 39. Anyone who attempted to rule Samaria without prophetic sanctions was assassinated. With this in mind, we need to study the, the two uh, two New Testament genealogies. First one is the one of Matthew. This is the genealogy of, of Joseph. Uh, breaks with normal tradition and customs, mentions four women. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Uh, they could have named uh, others like Sarah and something, but they didn't, and we kind of wonder why that is, but we'll, we'll talk about that too. Um, at least three of the four Gentiles, um, or, or pardon me, three of the four women were Gentiles. Um, these, uh, these three women were... Um, Let's see. Where is it? For Gentiles, and Matthew hints as to why this this situation was because Jesus. Oh, and the fourth. I'm sorry. Uh, the three of the four, uh, the four women were Gentiles, and possibly the fourth woman, meaning uh, uh, Bathsheba, because her husband was Uriah and he was a Hittite, so she was probably a Gentile too. And um, 
the uh, Jesus uh, proposes that uh, to save these lost sheep. These women were lost sheep, and Gentiles okay. would uh, Gentiles would benefit from that also. Three of these women were guilty of sexual sins, adultery, prostitution, and even incest. Mm. Ah, but but also again, uh, uh, any again the purpose of Messiah's coming was to save lost sinners. Amen. Yeah. Okay, Matthew also skips names, lists uh, from Abraham to David and then Joseph, but David uh, this, uh, many, and many sons, he picks Solomon. Uh, he, Solomon is chosen and then traces from uh, Jeconiah and from Jeconiah traces uh, back to Joseph or down to Joseph and, and direct descendants from, uh, through Solomon. Uh, Jeconiah line is very significant because uh, of the curse pronounced on, of Jeconiah. No descendant of Jack and I would have the right to the throne of David. Joseph was a direct line from David, and, but uh, through Jack and I, so no blood son of Joseph could sit on the David's throne to become the Messiah. I will read uh, Jack and I, uh, part, it's kind of skipped here, but the important parts in, Je in uh, I mean, Jeremiah uh, 22, 24 to 30. It says, as I live, declares the Lord, even though Jack and I, the son of Joachim, uh, king of Judah, where the signet ring on his right hand, yet I would pull it off. Uh, it is the man, uh, Jeconiah, uh, is despised, a shattered jar, or is he an undesirable vessel? Why have he and his descendants been uh, hurtled out of the, and cast into the land that they uh, had not known? O land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Write this man, Jack and I, down childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, uh, for no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling, um, ruling again in Judah. No descendant of Jack and I would have the right to the throne of David. Until Jeremiah, the first requirement for a, a messianic lineage was to be the house of David. With Jeremiah, it was limited even further. Um, no one had uh, had to be, or no one had to be not only of the house of David, but apart from Jeconiah. Uh, Joseph was a direct line from David, but through uh, Jeconiah, no blood son of Joseph could sit on the throne or become the Messiah. Amen. Okay. The purpose of Matthew's genealogy was not... To show royal line, but to show that it was Joseph. That if Joseph was with a real father, he would not qualify. Jesus would not be qualified to sit on David's throne. Okay, the, we'll do this, so let's do the the Luke now. Um, Luke follows strict Jewish customs. He does not cut out names. He mentions no women. However, if someone wanted to trace the line of a woman, they would uh, use the name of her husband as in Ezra uh, 261 or Nehemiah 763. So how would we know if it was Joseph's ge uh, genealogy or Mary's genealogy? In, in the Greek text uh, of Luke's genealogy, every single name mentioned has the Greek article the. In other words, it would be the Kevin or the Mike or the, the Bill or the Todd or whatever. <clears throat> okay. Um, the, okay, with, with one exception. The one exception was Joseph. Uh, someone with the understanding of this missing the, that it was not Joseph's genealogy, but his wife uh, Mary. Uh, also, many uh, translations of Luke reads, um, being supposedly the son of Joseph. So when it, uh, it was Joseph, the son of Heli, really, uh, really means Mary was the daughter of Heli. The Talmud also recognizes that Mary was the daughter of Heli. Joseph's actual father was named Jacob. Okay. Luke's genealogy also starts with Jesus and goes back to Adam. Uh, when it comes to the family of David, uh, in, in Matthew 3, 31, 32, instead of, uh, instead of having um, or naming uh, David's son Solomon, it names Nathan. So like Joseph, Mary's line, comes from David, but not unlike Joseph's line, uh, she comes from David through Nathan, 
apart from Jeconiah. So Jesus was a member of the house of David, but not through Jeconiah. Why Jesus? I mean, a lot of people might fall into this, this same, uh, same situation. Why, why Jesus? Um, Jews argue that Jesus could not uh, qualify based on genealogy of his father Joseph. Well, that would be true if Jesus' father was, was actually Joseph, but we know that for a different... Now, Jesus was totally different. If, uh, it follows, uh, uh, follows the lines except for some major things. Uh, like in uh, Genesis 3.15, it speaks of Jesus would be the, uh, come from the seed of a woman. In other words, his, his human part of him would come from a woman. Uh, and in Isaiah 7.14, it prophesied that Messiah would be born of a virgin. It says, Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call him Emmanuel. And his humanity, uh, his humanity, humanity would come from his mother. In conclusion, okay, um, as the son of David, it means that Jesus is king. As a son of Abraham, it means that Jesus is a Jew. As a son of Adam, it means that Jesus is a man. And as a son of God, it means that Jesus is God. Could this Messiah have been anything else? Fourfold portrait of Jesus, he is and was the Jewish man, God, and King. The, the um, it was difficult trying to find information on this because names have changed. Jack and I's name was called something else. Oh, and, yeah. it, yeah, and, it, and it just, <clears throat> it's confusing. So I finally came up with some information. And, and this is the reason I'm bringing this up is because some people in here will be doing the kingdom training and so on. But I went to the Jewish Jesus. Uh, there's a website. Uh, or if you Google Jewish, Jewish Jesus or the Masonic the messianic uh, Jesus, you find that there's a lot of good information that, that if you check it out, is really um, very truthful. Very, uh, so uh, that's uh, it. Okay. Well, first of all, that was amazing. That was very thorough. You really brought a lot of... I, I learned a lot from your presentation. And Sue, you did, did wonderful. <laughs> I, it was a really, really well thought out presentation, and I learned quite a bit from it. Um, the only thing I, I would add, and not really to take away, is just when you look at Jesus Christ, he fulfills every single requirement. Every single requirement. As Mike mentioned, needed to be born of a virgin. Needed to be born in a certain place. Now, he couldn't control that as a man, could he? Can you control where you're born? Look at all the things that Jesus um, did to fulfill Old Testament scripture. So it gives us confidence in our faith and in our belief. With that, we'll take up some questions. Chuck. Uh, talking about um, everyone will see salvation. Now, is that because the second coming, every knee shall bow, that everybody will experience salvation? Is that the differentiation that we see and experience? No. I, I didn't quite. Well, I, I it, it says that all flesh will see the salvation of God. This, no. the <laughs> statement highlights the fact that salvation is a free gift. It's still something that we individually have to receive. But it's not just for the Jews or the French or the Mexicans or Americans. It's awesome. Awesome. Now, everybody will see that if you're not a believer, you'll we'll see the stuff that you want to go to take part in. Yep, you, you have to She's be deceived in order to take part. Ava. What's interesting about genealogy is that some societies are matriarchal and some are patriarchal. You always know who the mother is. You don't always know who the Good point. Good point. That's a really good point. You always know who the mother is. Amen. I know, I know a few of those. Todd. <laughs> Oh, you had your, you look like your, anybody else? I'll make, I'll make another comment. Um, so, when Jesus fulfills all these things, it's a wonder that the Pharisees who studied everything missed it. Or did they? And that's the question. Did they miss it? 
on because of ignorance or lack of knowledge or did they not accept it because they knew the reality of it? That's an interesting question. I don't have an easy answer. Just maybe easy answer. Well, <laughs> well, me and Bill come up with these things and the overall answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Details, no. When a bunch of Jewish people get together and and start believing in Christ for, for particular reasons, it's, it's, it's interesting. We need to take note. Because these people were told and brought up from the time they were small in the Jewish uh, belief mm -hmm. and so on. And that excluded Christ. And they don't believe that, uh, they believe their Messiah is still coming. But it's, a lot of things have happened where it's too late for their Messiah to be coming. So they better start looking backwards instead of forwards in this case. Ooh. Well, there's going to come a time where he comes again. And a lot of their prophecies concerning well, the establishment yeah. of um, the kingdom will be concerned, they concern his second coming. But definitely there's a change. It's almost a change in Judaism from... Um, from time, the time of Christ, because before that, a lot of, a lot of their explanations for certain things included the Messiah, and now it seems like a lot of the things that Jesus fulfilled, they're trying to write away, they're trying to undermine, in order not to present him as the Messiah, and it's really difficult. Tell me. I saw a message the other day from the messianic message, mm -hmm. and if, if I'm not mistaken, I thought I'd heard them say that. Salvation comes from the Jews. Okay. Uh, salvation, when Jesus said, I went to the Jews first, I think a lot of it has to do with the fulfillment of prophecy that he presented himself and that those who rejected he would now go to the Gentiles. But it, come, it came through the Jews, meaning that the Old Testament was written through the Jews, representing Christ who would fulfill the Old Testament, who was Jewish. Now it's free and open to all who believe in Christ. Yes, ma'am. That's a great question, Tim. When they die, uh, what got when they die, they're not into God. How do you decide where they go? Ooh, well, that that's a that that that's a good question. When people die, even when Jewish people die without God or without the Messiah, where do they go? Um, the Bible is pretty clear that um, the only access into heaven is through Jesus. When you say, what about the Jews who Christ wasn't revealed before his time? Well, they were looking forward to the Messiah. Their belief and their lifestyle was kind of hinged upon um, his revelation. Then there's this picture of Luke. And in Luke's Gospel, in 16... It shows the rich man and Lazarus and, and the compartment of hell. They had, and he, Jesus was there and there was a great separation. Well, what is believed is that this, those who were looking forward to the Messiah, who lived their life based on that belief, were held until the revelation of Jesus at his death. And when he went to the lower parts of the earth, and it says he took captivity captive and lifted them up so that they would be saved by their belief in the coming Messiah. And Jesus fulfilled that in that revelation. We would say that we're held by his, our belief in his return in the same manner. Okay? But it's very, very clear, whether you're a Jew or Gentile, you have to receive Jesus. Because he is the only one that, that bridges the gap between us and God. He is the only one that mediates. Now, here's the greatest thing. And, and, and I really, I need to use this phrase more and more. There's always hope with God. And when you look at the thief on the cross, it really, really describes the hope that we have with God. And I, I saw something from a Jewish perspective the other day, and it's like, well, they had a hard time understanding that because if you had hope with God, you would have these things done in your life and you live your life by faith. But here's the thing. That thief on the cross didn't have time to exert any faith except, Lord, take me into your kingdom. He, and the Bible says he was a transgressor. It wasn't like he had things together. The prophecy is that he was a transgressor. It's not like he was a good man that got falsely accused. That was Jesus. It says that he was numbered with the transgressors. So there's always hope with God. He also transgressor as well. Yeah. He sent the other, hey, we deserve it. This guy don't. Amen. 
Good point. I, I have a, a thought. I had a thought that was going through this that um, we know that there are people still in the uh, in the far remote areas of the Amazon and so on who have not been really contacted by man. And you kind of wonder they've never got an opportunity to hear about Jesus or anything else. Um, but you know, fairness or what we call fairness. What you know? Do they get an opportunity? You believe after they die to really understand who Christ is and to accept Him or reject Him? And my answer would have to be, as far as I'm concerned, that is possibility. And you have to even transfer that to maybe the people that we know who are kind of fence walkers. You know, not one side, not the other, not de uh, not denying God, but not really accepting Me either. Maybe they will get one more chance to accept or deny God. That's Mike. That's not anything biblical. That's just me. <laughs> um, the Bible says in Romans 1 that they are without excuse. But here's the other aspect. We look at, because it doesn't state the details of that, right? We don't know for sure. So then, to me, I have to look at God's character, and I have to look at one other thing, ignorance. If people die not hearing and they're in ignorance, is God a God that would condemned because of ignorance and I don't see so I see a total different sacrifice even in the even in the Levitical system for one that was purposeful and one that was done in ignorance but I can't tell you that I know for sure I just know this they're without excuse and I believe that if somebody really has a heart to know God in one way or one aspect God's going to reveal himself to that person I can rest in that now I don't know the details but I just know one once again there is always hope with God Sarah, you had something? Um, regarding John, what a great example of a humble person, right? I mean, he had multiple opportunities to say, oh, actually, yes, I am the Messiah, because people asked him if he was. And he says that he's not even worthy to untie his shoes. Amen. You know, um, and we see so often in other places in the Bible where people, people take their power and they completely abuse it, where you have John a great example of someone who is completely humble and he knows where <coughs> the credit and also the responsibility like all of that life is Jesus. Amen. What a great example for us. Amen. <coughs> a great example. Bill. Bill and then uh, I think we're going to close out. <coughs> I just want to address the comment about salvation is of the Jews and that's from John 4 and it's Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman about worshiping in two different areas and he mm -hmm. said salvation that it was a dispute over where the temple should be. It was and through the Jews, the yeah. Of what he's speaking in, and then he says the time is coming, and now is where people worship in spirit and truth. So he's telling you that that's being just uh, eliminated. The right. temple system is coming away. That's why we don't want to take a verse out of context and build the doctrine. Right. Right. You know. Well, and that's what he was he was alluding to through the Jews, through the whole Jewish system, rather than the system of basically of Israel which was basically at that point what they considered half-breeds because they allowed other things come in and they actually established uh, another place of worship called Mount Jerizim and in that place they only worship <coughs> certain aspects of Judaism not the complete thing once again it's through the Jewish system that Jesus would come and then he said I did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it and so that is the whole context. And then we'll pray up. I truly believe that when all is said and done, there'll be nobody in heaven that doesn't belong doesn't belong there, and there'll be nobody in hell that doesn't belong there. <laughs> Man, that's a, that's a statement you can rest on. Let's pray up. <laughs> I know there's more questions. Father, we come before you, and we just thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Thank you, Lord, for revealing certain truths to us. And that we can have confidence in our faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Anointed One. May you be glorified and may you be honored, not only, Lord, through our study of the Word, but how we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Very good. Very good.
If you get them 10x, they're like three, four hundred. You can get cheaper ones for like Wait, how much is your nephew's one cost? Thank you. 